Let me read to you a passage from the 25th chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel, verses 31 to 46. It's the Gospel for Monday of the first week in Lent. I shall only read part of it because it's a long passage. St. Matthew writes, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right hand, and the goats on his left. <clears throat> Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you, since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I tell you the truth, whatever you did for the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do, for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. That's from Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. At least a selection of that passage. And what does it suggest to us? Well, you know, I well remember how it used to be thought among some Christian circles that to place much emphasis on the judgment of God is unworthy of the Christian life. What ought be the distinguishing feature of a Christian life, it was said, is the love of God, and love casts out fear. Well, of course, the latter part of this statement can be taken as true. The love of God does distinguish the Christian religion. For instance, I remember one expert in Islamic studies maintaining that Islam critiques Christianity for its failing to emphasize sufficiently the transcendence of God. He said that in this respect Islam does not look on God so much as Father, and certainly not in the sense Christ taught as Abba, dear Father, but rather as the Sovereign Lord and Master. Allah is Master rather than Father. Well, if this is a fair analysis, then it highlights the fact that the love of God distinguishes the Christian religion, with its roots, of course, in the religion of the Old Testament. God is love and the religion he revealed is one of love. Accordingly, the love of God progressively casts out fear, and perhaps it may be, may be said that the absolute perfection of love will cast out all fear. But on the way to this perfection of love, the fear of God will be wholesomely present. And what is it that man has reason to fear? It is the judgment of God, because he, man, is a sinner. His trust is in the merits of Christ, but he finds he continues to sin nevertheless. While Christ came to reveal in his person and teaching the love of God, he also revealed the judgment of God. Indeed, it would be difficult to show that any founder of a great religion emphasized as much the judgment of God on mankind as did Christ. John Henry Newman once wrote, that the thought of a judgment is the first principle of religion, implying that without this thought, religion is weak in its foundation. With it, religion has a chance of being genuine and strong. So, Christ's emphasis on the divine judgment has the effect, if taken seriously, of giving to personal religion a sure and strong basis. In the history of religions, Christ's description of the judgment of God as given in our passage today is near to being unique. The first thing to be said about it is that Jesus himself 
will be the one and only judge of all mankind. He will judge Buddha. He will judge Confucius. He will judge Muhammad and all the followers of these religions. He will judge the great and the mighty, such as Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, Genghis Khan, and all who have exercised great power in the world. He will judge the small too, the ones who have had but one talent, but who have failed perhaps to use it. Our Lord told a parable about the talents given to various servants. The harshest judgment in the parable was made on the one who was lazy and wicked in not using the one talent he had been given. Incidentally, what is the significance of the little man, the little person? His significance is that the vast flow of history depends on all the little men. If they, each and all, do their little bit in obeying God to the best of their ability, the plan of God in history is more able to succeed. So yes, they will be judged by God, as will the great and the mighty. So in our passage today, that I read earlier, our Lord makes it clear that he himself will be the judge, and he will judge everyone. Moreover, not only will each be judged individually, but all will be judged together. The whole world will be judged by Christ. At the end of time, Christ will judge the entire world. As we read, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. The upshot will be awful, full of awe. Those on the right will go to heaven forever, and those on the left will go to hell, to hell forever. This great fact ought underpin all that we do, because, granted the precariousness of life, we all stand moment by moment on the edge. One heartbeat can send us into the hands of the all-powerful living God, who loves us, but who is our judge nevertheless. A lively awareness of the judgment of God as revealed by Christ provides a firm foundation and a constant stimulus to a vital religion. It makes the presence of God felt, for reward and punishment are ahead. Our eternal happiness is at stake. In light of this solid fact, this solid fact of the divine judgment, we are able to appreciate the love of God, who has done so much to save and sanctify us, for he wants us to be with him in heaven forever. Let us then take to heart our Lord's account of the judgment he will deliver on each and every person who walks the road of human history.